Good morning, and welcome to Broadmeadow United Methodist Church. Here at Broadmeadow, no matter where you come from or you're going, what you believe or doubt, what you're feeling or not feeling, what you have or don't have, and no matter whom you love, all of who you are is welcome into this community of faith by a God who loves you passionately. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Broadmeadow. Let us open up in prayer. Almighty God, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross. Grant that we may share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is number 280, All Glory, Loud, and Honor. We'll sing the first, third, and fifth verse. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together. Affirmation of faith found in your bulletin. We believe in a God who walks head first into the world's suffering, who lights a candle in the darkest night, who pulls back the curtain so we can see the stars. We believe in a God who does not shy away from the truth, who is bold in seeking justice and humble in taking power. We believe in a God who sees our hurt and wraps love around us, cocooning us in hope, tethering us to one another. We believe in a God who is always carrying us from the pain of the world into the hope of a new day. That is where God is headed. That is where we follow. May it be so. Amen. Hosanna in 
for illumination. Holy God, sometimes it's hard to hear you over the hosannas. Sometimes it's hard to hear you over the noise of the city streets. Sometimes it's hard to hear you over our racing thoughts, our mental to-do list, or our desire to fit in. But sometimes it's hard to hear you in this noisy world. So just as you stop traffic in Jerusalem, stop traffic here, pause the rush, open the gates, dwell among us until your word is all we hear. We are listening. We are laying down our cloaks. Amen. And our Old Testament reading is from Matthew 21, 1 through 11. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and the Mount of Olives, Jesus said, gave two disciples a task. He said to them, go into the village over there. As soon as you enter, you will find a donkey tied up with a colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anybody says anything to you, say that the Lord needs it. He sent them off right away. Now this happened to fulfill what the prophet said. Say to daughter Zion, look, your king is coming, humble and riding on a donkey, and on the colt, the donkey's offspring. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had ordered them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them. Then he sat on them. Now a large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Others cut palm branches off the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds in front of him and behind him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up. Who is this, they asked. The crowds answered, it's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. And now, if you will join me in our Psalter for today, um, it's hymn number 764, and we're going to read Psalm 31, verses 9 through 6. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I'm in distress. My eye is wasted from grief my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery and my bones waste away. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of the mind like one who is dead I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many, terror all around, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me through your steadfast love. The hymn of preparation is O Sacred Head Now Wounded. It's number 286.
not ready to read the passion story just yet so we're going to call an audible and put that off until a little bit later so let's pray mighty god may the words of my mouth and indeed the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you our strength and our redeemer amen well today is palm sunday it's also called passion sunday we kind of mesh those two together, not because I, I think anybody wanted to, but because uh, there is a uh, practical realization that a lot of people won't show up to midweek services. And so uh, we don't want you to get the triumphal entry and skip straight ahead to the resurrection. We, like, we have to have the crucifixion somewhere in there. And, and we're, we're going to read that a little bit later, but I, I do think that one of the issues we have sometimes is that Palm Sunday gets a little bit of the short shrift. I mean, yes, we've got, you know, churches have the kids come in waving the palms like we did with Julian, and that's, it's cute, it's wonderful, but we use Palm Sunday to look ahead to Easter, well, to, to Good Friday and to Easter, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I think that we do need to spend a little bit of time in Palm Sunday a little bit. It's the beginning of Holy Week, but in and of itself, it's an important thing that is happening. It's an important story. It is an important part of the life of Jesus. It is its own thing, and, and we need to kind of take a moment to sit in it, to dwell in it. We, we often use, and you've probably, most of you, if you've heard many sermons on Palm Sunday and, and Good Friday, you've probably heard the story and you've heard it explained. These are the same crowds, right? The crowd that, that's yelling Hosanna and welcoming Jesus into the, the city on Palm Sunday just a few days later, the ones saying crucify him, crucify him. And it's not a bad, it's not a bad sermon, don't get me wrong. You'll hear it again someday and I, I think it's, it's, it's a fine one. I'm not actually sure it's the same crowd, but that's me. If I'm not going to go off in the weeds there. But let's, I mean, but let's again talk about this story. What happens to begin with is Jesus is embodying prophecy for a moment. Jesus sends his disciples into kind of Bethphage, this, this, what we would call now a suburb of Jerusalem. And as they have been traveling, of course, to Jerusalem, his disciples have, have asked him, well, where are you headed? Where, where are we going? Where are you headed? And he says, to Jerusalem. And they, say, and they say, well, Jesus, if you go to Jerusalem, they'll kill you. And Jesus said, but I have to go. Well, where are you headed? And, and so he goes, and he sends his disciples to Bethphage, and he says, I want you to get a, I want you to, you're, you're going to find a donkey, and you're going to find a colt. And you're going to take that donkey and that you're going to take that colt because I need it. And people are going to ask you why, and you're going to tell them why, and they're going to let you have it. Now, this is kind of the first thing that there's a prophet who says, you know, say to daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, a donkey's offspring. And the prophet was kind of utilizing poetic repetition, a donkey, a colt. I mean, it's the same thing. But Matthew is really trying to, to get literal here, and he says, you know, Jesus is riding in on both a donkey and a colt, which seems kind of awkward to me. 
trying to ride two different, two different pack animals at the same time. But, but what's happening, I mean, really, he, he's, he's embodying scripture. Matthew wants to kind of show that this is Jesus who, it, it, this isn't coming out of nowhere. And the people who welcome Jesus in know exactly what Jesus is doing. The crowds and, and the, the, the rumors about Jesus have said, that here's someone that we think might be the Messiah, might be the king. And so they're waiting on signs to show them that that's who he is. And what happens is he rides into Jerusalem on a colt, on a donkey, and they say, I know where that's from. I've read that one. And there is a, a sense that that two things are happening. Jesus is proclaiming two things by riding on a donkey. First off, he's, he's saying, this is who I am. I'm the king. I'm the, I'm the Messiah. I'm the, the promised one. But also, I'm coming in humility. Because and, and we have talked about this before, but it bears repeating. Jesus is doing something else, too. He is making a point. He is engaging in a kind of street theater with what he's doing here because Jesus on one side of town is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey surrounded by his disciples welcomed by the common people by the poor by the oppressed by the folks who, who don't have enough food in their bellies but they're in Jerusalem for Passover which is one of the high holy days of the Jewish tradition of the Jewish faith and you you know what Passover is about, right? Passover is commemorating years before when, when Israel was in Egypt, enslaved in Egypt. And the, the people, the Hebrew people were told, what I want you to do by God, I want you to sit down and I want you to have a meal. And I will come, and God says, I will come and I will free you. I will bring destruction to the Egyptians and I'm going to set you free and tomorrow you're going to head out. Now here is Israel, here is Judea, here are the, the, the people of Israel who are no longer under the yoke of Egypt, they're under the yoke of Rome. And Jerusalem swells to five or six times the size that it usually is during Passover because everybody wants to come in and make sacrifices at the temple. So it's, it's completely full. It's packed to the, I mean, it's just packed as a city with people who are talking about when God released them from an oppressive empire. So you can imagine that it's a volatile time and a volatile place. What are you talking about now? Well, you remember when God freed us from Egypt? Maybe this is the year that God frees us from Rome. And you have enough people who are all crowded together talking about that at the same time. And there is likely that violence, that rebellion is going to break out. In fact, it's happened before. happened before. Shortly before Jesus was born, there was a great rebellion that was put down mercilessly by Rome during the Passover. Rome executed so many people that there were no trees for miles around Jerusalem because they had cut them all down to make crosses. Passover in Jerusalem it was a dangerous time, and Rome knew it. The Roman Empire knew it. The, the local governor, Pontius Pilate, knew it. And so while Jesus was riding in on a donkey, surrounded by the common people on one side of town, on the other side of town, at the same time, what was happening was Pilate, the Roman governor, is riding in through the opposite gates. He's riding in. Instead of riding a donkey, he's riding a war horse. Instead of surrounded by apostles, instead of surrounding by, surrounded by disciples, he's surrounded by the legions, by the, by the soldiers of Rome. Instead of being greeted by the common people, by the poor, by the oppressed, he's greeted by the wealthy, by the powerful, the local dignitaries, the high priests, 
the local nobles. And they are yelling as he walks in, here comes the conqueror, here comes Rome, mighty, great Rome. Here comes a representative of Caesar, king of kings, lord of lords, for that was his title. And on the other side of town from this important, powerful procession, this procession that looks exactly what we usually imagine power to look like, comes riding in Jesus. Not on a war horse, but on a donkey. Not with armor, but just a simple robe. Not surrounded by soldiers, but by disciples. Not being greeted by the high priest. Not being greeted by the local nobles, but being greeted by the poor. By those who felt the effects of the evil of Rome the most. And they are not... They are not yelling. They are not proclaiming, here comes, my, here comes the mighty conqueror. What they are proclaiming is, Hosanna, save us, save us, save us. And so you, you see, the people had a decision to make. And I wonder how many of them asked each other, well, where are you headed? Where are you headed? Are you headed to one side of town to see the representative of the great empire of, the, of Caesar? Are you, are you going to, to kind of fall to the back and you're going to see Pontius Pilate ride in with the great armies of Rome? Are you going to take your place with the important people? Is that what you're going to do? Are you headed over there to proclaim the greatness of the destructive power of Rome? Or are you going to head to the other side of town to see Jesus, to lay your cloaks, to lay your, your robes, to lay your palms on the ground? Ask him to save you. Where are you headed? That's the question. You have a choice to make. We have a choice to make. We all have a choice to make. Which way are we headed? What will we choose? Which procession will we attend? Pilate or Jesus? Violence or peace, hatred or love. Now, I mean, yes, we are in church today, and so we like to think that we'll absolutely, we will go to that side of the, the city. We're going to go and we're going to welcome Jesus in. But before we get too proud of ourselves, let's remember how often the church has just dressed Pilate up as Jesus. How often have we claimed to follow Jesus, but actually followed the way of the empire. Let's be real. Yeah, the crowd turned on Jesus, and they turned on Jesus because he didn't look enough like Pilate. What they were hoping for was for Jesus to look just like the empire, for him to come in on a war horse, for him to hold a sword in his hand, for him to, to have the armies that he had called forth surrounding him, but what he did was he came in with humility. He came in showing that God does not look like what we want God to look like sometimes. And so often what the church does, so often what we of people of faith do is instead of saying, well, I want to follow Jesus, what we say is, well, I'll, I'll follow Rome, I'll follow Pilate, but I'll just, I'll call him Jesus. We do that, right? We do that every time we use our faith, we use the church, we use the name of God, we use the name of Christ to uphold our own hatred, 
Every time we use the church to, every time we use Jesus' name to, bab, to try and baptize our bigotry, our racism, our sexism, our homophobia, or whatever it is, like every time we do it, we are actually following Pilate. We're proclaiming Pilate. We're headed over to that side of town. We're worshiping power and calling it Jesus. But what we are called to do is to go to the other side of town and welcome the one who comes in humbly, riding on a donkey with nothing but open hands that are ready to heal, that are ready to forgive. The one who comes in prepared to die for us. Who instead of building a cross will end up on it. So where are we headed today? Where are we going? We're going to go to the side of town, or we're going to go to the gates, or we're going to go to the procession that that uplifts what we think of as power, the way that that our our own our own ability to hate other people and destroy other people and and hurt other people, or are we going to send? Are we going to go to the side of town? Are we going to welcome? Are we headed over to the place where Jesus comes in to the city, where Jesus comes into our lives? Are we going to say, please save us. Save us from our hatred. Save us from our love of violence. Save us from everything that keeps us away from one another, that keeps us separated from each other, that keeps us separated from God. Save us. Where are we headed today? Where are we going? Who are we welcoming into our lives? This is why we invite everyone to the table, right? Because here we get to experience Jesus Christ. God's grace through Christ. God's love for us. God's love for the whole world. And this is why every time we have communion, I remind you that it doesn't belong to me. I don't get to guard the table. I don't get to tell you who can and cannot come. It's not mine. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to Broadmeadow. We don't get to, we don't get to fence the table. It doesn't even belong to the United Methodist Church. This is God's table and everybody is welcome here. Everybody. We do communion by intention. You'll be offered a piece of bread. Take the bread, dip it into the cup. I know that we are not, as much as we all wish we were, we're not at the the end of our, our pandemic time. And if you do not feel comfortable dipping into the common cup, just take the bread. It's okay. But you're gonna be invited to this place, to this table. And and you're welcome here. No matter what. You're welcome here. So I'd ask you to turn to page 12. In your hymnal. Sorry, not the Bible, in the hymnal. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. 
Now let us offer one another signs of reconciliation and love. The peace of the Lord be with you. Great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In love you made us for yourself. We, when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remained steadfast. You bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Easter feast that renewed by your word and sacraments and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those who love you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Glory, glory, glory. Holy, holy, holy. God of glory, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is why I have the book of worship. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to redeem emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water of on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance. So, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving to the holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit and all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry. 